I'd really like to dive into Tylenol. It's all the rage. Everybody's talking about Tylenol, and it's just absolutely amazing how anything in today's day and age, whether it makes sense or doesn't, is politicized for one side or the other. Now, I don't really give uh, uh, two squirts about politics too terribly much. I just want to help people. And so I, I just find it atrocious that um, that we're sitting here having to talk about this. But nonetheless, I want to give you my in, my um, my input. So what's all the hubbub about Tylenol? Basically, it comes from this study that was just recently published uh, in Environmental Health. And what they did, the authors of this study, they did it was a meta-analysis of 46 different studies. So they took 46 research studies included in this analysis. 27 of these 46 studies reported positive associations between Tylenol intake in pregnant women and neurological developmental disorders. Nine of these studies showed null associations, meaning no significant link between the two, and four indicated negative associations. So the end result was the vast majority of these studies showed there was correlation between Tylenol use during pregnancy and neurological developmental disorders. That's something we shouldn't ignore. Didn't matter who you are siding with politically. This is data we want to pay attention to. Because why? Because if you are a pregnant woman and there's even a small increased risk of your child being born with neurological developmental disorder that can impact the rest of their life and the rest of your life, some of these really severe cases of autistic disorder. These kids are dependent on their parents for the rest of their life and they're going to outlive their parents. And who's going to take care of these, these adult children when their parents are gone? So if we can improve those numbers, if we can reduce those numbers, and obviously we want to pay attention to these types of signals that researchers are picking up. Now, that being said, there is an association. And of course, association doesn't mean causation. Nobody's saying that. We were just simply saying we need to pay more attention to it. So the FDA has recently responded to this evidence, and here's basically what they said. The FDA is taking action to make parents and doctors aware of considerable body of evidence about these potential risks. This is the letter that the FDA composed and wrote and sent out to doctors, which I think was a great idea. Doctors should be aware. In recent years, evidence has accumulated suggesting that the use of acetaminophen by pregnant women may be associated with an increased risk of neurological conditions such as autism and ADHD. Some studies have described that the risk may be most pronounced when acetaminophen is taken chronically throughout pregnancy. In other words, the greater the dose, the greater the risk. Nobody's disagreeing on that. These concerns may be magnified by the fact that a very young child's liver may still be developing and thus a child's ability to metabolize the drug may be limited. Well, even beyond that, a child in utero um, definitely doesn't have liver development. And of course, the toxic compound produced by Tylenol uh, in pregnant women can pass through the placenta and affect the child. So, so again, let's make more people aware. But I think the main problem, it's not just Tylenol. And the reason why everybody's up in arms and blowing smoke and beating their political chests around this is they have ideologies that differ. But in reality, we just want people to be healthy. So why, let's just look at what does Tylenol do? Tylenol damages the liver. This is in chronic doses. And and one of the things it causes in the liver is it reduces this major master antioxidant substance called glutathione. Now, glutathione, if you want, I really encourage you to watch my, my crash course. It's over an hour long, and we do a deep dive on the importance of glutathione in human health and disease. But when you reduce glutathione, basically what you do is you increase oxidative damage. So you, you, you cause chemical-like damage when there's a reduction. And this also affects the detoxification. So how do humans detox from environmental chemicals like microplastics and heavy toxic metals like mercury and different types of medications or drugs, um, as well as alcohol, as well as things we're exposed to through our food chain and through our food supply. We know like, for example, corn syrup damages 
glutathione production, too much corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. So if we're being exposed to all of these things and all of these things are diminishing our glutathione storage, certainly some are going to be at greater risk than others because some pregnant mothers are eating poorly and are being exposed to many things. And so their use of Tylenol might lead to greater degrees of risk than say someone who's trying to eat really healthfully and exercise and has really great um, lifestyle choices around health. Now, I, I want to point something out around this that when we look at pregnant women, this was a study published um, just last January. And what they found, they were doing an analysis of quantitatively how many pregnant women have something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And why is this important? Because if we're talking about pregnant women and the health of their liver, if they're taking Tylenol, part of the way their body is going to process that Tylenol is through a healthy liver. So how many pregnant women actually have a problem with non-alcoholic fatty liver? And so according to this research study, it's about 14%. Well, that's an alarmingly high number. 14% approximately of pregnant women have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Of, co of course, there are race differences. So 17% of Hispanics have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, so the highest bunch. And, and so if we have that high of a prevalence of liver damage in mothers that are giving birth, wouldn't it go to say that we should turn our attention and our sights on educating these women, you know, preconception about how to improve the health of their liver? In my opinion, the answer is pretty no brainer. It's pretty simple. So all that being said, let's talk for just a moment about glutathione, because it's my opinion that if you're pregnant and you're having pain or fever, there also are risks of women with fever and birth defects in their children. So there's, you know, there's two sides to this. It's not just so simple. It's a complex issue, but at the, at its core, how do we support a pregnant woman so that God forbid she needed to take a Tylenol um, that, that, we can reduce the potential risk of this happening. And so the, the main way is to improve or to enhance glutathione. So if we look at, at this GSH, this is glutathione. And one of the core structures of glutathione is its amino acid uh, component. So there's three major amino acids, L-glutamine, L-cysteine, and glycine that combine together to form glutathione. So one of the things that we see very commonly today in pregnant women is we see a uh, low protein diet. Thank you in large part to Bill Gates and his ilk, um, demonizing animal proteins. So we see reduction of protein in the diet and we see high carb diet predominantly in the form of refined carbs. And we look at refined carbs, where, where does the majority of refined carbs come from in the US diet? It's from grain based items, predominantly high fructose, corn syrup, among other things, cereal breads, pastas that are highly refined. And so when we have a diet that's high in refined carbohydrates, what that does is it depletes glutathione. And if the diet is also low in protein, it further de depletes the amino acids necessary to produce glutathione. Now, when you couple that with the fact that these diets are highly processed and low in nutrients like vitamin E and vitamin C and lipoic acid and vitamin B2 and vitamin B3, these are the nutrients that are necessary to help recycle glutathione. Your body, once it makes it, it can recycle and regenerate it but it needs other antioxidants to do that, antioxidants like vitamin E and vitamin C. So if you have a diet that's highly refined, carbohydrate-based, low protein, low in nutrients like lipoic acid and vitamin C and selenium and magnesium and glycine and cysteine, and here's vitamin B2 here, um, and also low in nutrients that would support glutathione's production, like brassica, vegetables, green tea is a great way to get extra glutathione. So this is where we're at. As a society, we eat like, excuse my language, but that's just the truth. We eat poorly. We have women who are becoming pregnant who are already obese before they become pregnant, and they already have a, 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 a tremendous amount of them already have evidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and glutathione depletion as a, as a consequence to that. And so now what Tylenol becomes is Tylenol just becomes the proverbial straw that breaks 
the back, unfortunately, of that child and has a potentiation for autism and other neurological developmental disorders. So if you're, you know, again, we're not saying causation, we're saying it's multifactorial and many things add up to increase the risk. What do we wanna do? Ultimately, we wanna reduce this. And so how do we do that? We reduce all the risks and Tylenol is one of them, but bad diets are another. Um, certainly lack of activity, lack of sunshine, poor self care, all of these things are gonna play a role. Poor nutrition, smoking, uh, exposure to pesticides, exposure to herbicides, exposure to plastics, exposure to chemicals that are used as preservatives in our food, like all these things add up to create the perfect storm that now when we add certain things in, that risk just enhances even higher. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more context around this issue. I'm of the opinion that this right here, this whole argument right now is more of a, than anything, it's just one huge distraction from the core issue at hand. This is distracting us all from the real conversation. Um, you know, it's one of those things I can't mention um, lest the sensor bots really want to take over here. But, you know, many of you take your children in to what we call well checkups or well checks. To me, that's a very misleading term because there's nothing well about it. And when you take your child in to get those done, of course, there's the exposure. And many of you know what I'm talking about. There's the exposure through this well check to numerous other chemicals and adjuvants. And I think it's Tylenol is a distraction from this because this was making its way through the media cycle and becoming more and more, people were becoming more and more aware of looking at this and asking different questions about what we've all been told historically. So it's my advice that we get back to the, to the real investigation and quit being distracted. But now that you, you know, have my take, many of you asked me what my take is, hopefully that's helpful for you in your own life and help you make some better decisions.